Hello everyone, welcome to this discussion on faith and assisted dying. I'm Robert Ince, I'm a Unitarian and I'm President of the International Association for Religious Freedom. With me today are Canon Rosie Harper, Rector of Great Missenden and a member of the General Synod of the Church of England. Rabbi Jonathan Romain, writer, broadcaster and leader of the Reform Synagogue in Maidenhead and Dr. Taj Hagi, Director of the Muslim Education Centre for Oxford. For people of faith, coming to a position on the subject of assisted dying is never going to be simple. Religious leaders have generally expressed their opposition to assisted dying, and yet many within their ranks have begged to differ and offered alternative arguments, often in the name of love and compassion for those who find themselves faced with unbearable suffering. Rosie, do you think Christians, and especially their leaders, are making up their minds on assisted dying by listening to their conscience first and then consulting the Bible? Or are they likely to reflect on their texts and then decide? It's a fascinating question, and I think it's a question that cuts across nearly every moral decision that a Christian is called to make. And I'd love to think that it was as simple as, do you listen to your conscience or do you look at the text first? But to be truthful, I think it's a much more human question than that. And most people respond to some inner drivers and their emotional stance in response to the question. Um, and I think if people, which what I'd love them to do, would change their minds, that's the route that you have to approach, the, 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 the deep emotional feelings. I've discovered through years of Christian ministry that um, people can come to a position about something and then find a text to support it, almost anything. You can make the Bible say almost anything. And what I find really difficult is when people listen to my position about assisted dying, which, as you rightly say, has to do with compassion and to do with freedom and to do with autonomy and all the things which you know other aspects of your faith really endorse. People will say to me, yes, Rosie, basically, I, I can see what you mean, and, and, and I kind of agree with you, but God says, and I feel as if there's that opportunity to outsource your moral responsibility to take uh, ownership of what you really feel and think, and say, I would agree with you, but God says something different, which leaves people in a highly conflicted situation about it, and I think that's why uh, feelings get so fraught about this. And Christian leaders feel as if whatever they say is going to set the tone for the way in which the whole um, Christian community responds. And because of that, we are now seriously out of kilter between what people in the pews genuinely feel, and they feel the same as everyone else in the country, about 80% of people would like a better conversation about assisted dying. And the leaders who feel this burden to carry some sort of totemic, um, theoretical, response to an issue which is actually a gut response. Thank you. Do, Jonathan, how do you think Jews would make their, their mind up? If... Well, I suppose religious decision making has always been a sort of, for me at least, a three-legged stool. Uh, one is the sacred texts, in, in, in our case the Hebrew Bible. Um, a, a second will be subsequent religious literature, uh, as interpreted by the rabbis and the sages over the years. But, but also, a third one would be um, uh, general knowledge, um, the, the, uh, uh, from sort of uh, insights, the knowledge uh, from other sources, uh, from secular sources. But then, at the same time, how do you choose between which of those three legs? Uh, and that's where I think conscience comes in. And to be very honest, I suspect that I, in fact, I know that I actually decide whether it's on any issue, whether it's on, on abortion or gay marriage or assisted dying. I, I have a feel of what I'm, is right, and then I look back at the, and find which text is going to support it. And I am strongly sure that other people do the same thing. Mm. That those people who, um, for instance, are against gay marriage will go straight to a text that supports their view, whereas if they're happy with it, they'll go to another one. So I think, actually, religious leaders cheat quite a lot. Um, and, and what is, or, or, although of course scripture and tradition are, are enormously important in informing us and giving us a framework, 
I think personal confidence is, is the overriding factor when there's such a, 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 one of these sort of crucial moral areas where frankly the argument can go either way and it's actually something within me that says, impelled by my mix of religious tradition and modern understanding, this is the conclusion I want and hey presto, here's a text that supports it. Tash. What happens in the Islamic world? Well, I mean, the, that we need to distinguish between the, what is the Islamic world and what's not. I mean, in Islam we have various traditions. We have the orthodox, the traditional, the liberal, the reformed, the progressive. And myself, I'm obviously on the liberal side of things and uh, I don't follow the traditional and orthodox perspectives of Islam. Uh, most Muslims who are orthodox and traditionalists, they are literalists. They, to them, they will first go to the text and if the text says A, B, and C, and they come up with a situation that says D, D, they won't accept that. And I think uh, for me, there's never been a dichotomy between creed and conscience. Uh, I'm fully uh, of the of, uh, of the view that Islam says for all of us. Uh, in fact, the Quran repeatedly tells people, why don't you think? Why don't you understand uh, that this book is for a book for those who contemplate, who ponder, who reflect? And so for me, it was the reason, your brain, and revelation. So the brain in the book, reason, revelation. There was no, there's never been a dichotomy. And so when I come across issues like, say, environmental pollution, gay marriage, sister dying, all the hot button issues of our time, uh, I don't find a lot of uh, uh, cerebral uh, contradictions there. Because my faith, the way I understand it, is it asks you to engage with things of a timely and a timeless uh, manifestation and, and aspects. In other words, you can't be a zombie Muslim and to be a robotic believer. Then you can't live in, in the 21st century. We have to be uh, people of, of thought, of thinking and critical thinking. And that means sometimes you have to go against the, the grain. For example, uh, if we had a discussion, uh, say, 100 year, uh, 200 years ago about slavery, uh, which was a hot button issue that day and, and the different faiths would, 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 would respond differently. And today when we look back and say, how could people actually have defended slavery from a theological point of view? And similarly now when we fast forward uh, another hundred years, uh, we say, why would the people in the debating assist dying? So I think it's important that we have a, a faith that uh, gives credence to thinking and crit critical uh, thought. The only thing is, of course, with slavery, uh, at least there were some texts about it, mm -hmm. whether we approve of them or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, there aren't really any uh, texts on assisted dying. So it's such a modern concept, it just was never envisaged in any of our scriptures. Yeah, but uh, so we have to sort of hunt around for things that might be a clue. Uh, and, um, and so people will say, well, God gives and God takes. But it doesn't mean to say you can't say to God, well, thank you very much, but now I'd like to gently hand it back. Um, or there's that lovely line in Ecclesiastes where it says uh, there's a time to be born and a time to die. And everyone quotes that, but they forget it doesn't say who chooses. The assumption is it's God chooses. Well, actually, it doesn't say that at all. And it may well be, and I would believe, that actually we can choose and say, particularly if you're terminally ill and you're in pain and you're suffering, that actually, thank you, God, I think it's now time. Yeah, but 100 years ago, no one, 100 years ago, who would know that you only have six months left? Today we have such a modern technology that we, with a great degree of precision we can say, listen, your organs are failing and the likelihood of you surviving beyond three months, six months or a year or whatever is quite negligible. And if that's the case then, and you have excruciating pain and we talk about compassion and love and, 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 and uh, consideration, if, if, if the creator is this... Uh, all-encompassing, affectionate, compassionate, merciful creature or entity, wouldn't he want something less painful uh, for us in our, in our last few days on this planet? Well, I agree, which is exactly why, you know, I, I used to be in, against assisted dying mm. for all the traditional reasons. Mm. Um, but actually, um, having thought about it, having seen so many people suffering in hospitals and hospices, and also now being aware of the enormous number of safeguards that are being mm. suggested to prevent the vulnerable or whatever um, be, being uh, taken advantage of, now I, I've got no doubt at all that it is actually not only a uh, practical option that should be offered to people, mm. but it's a religious way forward. Yeah. And it's religiously justified as well as morally. If I may, Robert, I just want to add on this issue about the uh, safeguards. I think 
the current safeguards are not enough, in my humble opinion. Uh, at the moment, we have we need two doctors to sort of certify that you know you have X amount of days left, whatever. I would actually want to add a, a third tier. In other words, you, the person in, in excruciating pain and, and coming towards the end of his life and his organs are failing, the GP or someone in the GP practice must must certify. The next person is the uh, uh, NHS specialist that's treating you, uh, the consultant who's on the register list. And then the third one I would like to add is that we have to ask the GMC to appoint subcommittees to uh, uh, look at these things. So a three-person subcommittee then will become the final arbiter uh, whether the, the, the GP and the uh, specialist makes the case on paper to this uh, GMC subcommittee who would then look at the data and see, listen, is this now something that cannot be, uh, the, the process of dying is, is, is imminent and we shouldn't be prevent them from doing so. So I, I want to see the GMC involved so that we have the most stringent safeguard because people from my faith will say, ah, oh, well, we are all, we, well, it's assisted dying, it's like euthanasia, it's like suicide and we're playing God and all of that type of stuff. I think we should take that a little bit by imposing these added restrictions and safeguards, I think you make that thing a bit more sellable, if that's the word, in, say, the Muslim community or in some other community. Yeah, so it's interesting because that point is really important um, because people think that it's all right now. Mm. And, of course, actually it isn't. What you're suggesting means that it's safer than it is now mm. because there's still an awful lot of in-hospitals where we'll just slip him a little, you know, yes. or we'll just stop feeding him or we'll no. just stop this and we'll just... No, you know. And lots of assisted dying actually happens but by the back door yeah. without things being articulated. Mm. So I think once it's, once it's in the open, right. actually it becomes safer than it is now. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Jonathan, can I, can I sort of ask you a, a different question from a from a jewish point of view is life sacred and, and what does that actually mean in the context of assisted dying yes well i'm glad you asked the question in that way because you have to define what sacred is so for me i would sacred is a very ethereal word i mean just to bring it down to ground um i would say yes life is sacred in the sense that it is special it needs to be treated with respect um uh, handled with care um, the person honoured, um, uh, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that every last second of your life has to be lived. Uh, and so that, as we've already touched on, if someone is uh, A, dying, uh, B, mentally competent, uh, C, in either indignity or pain, and they wish to let go of life, then they should have that right because it's their life. Um, and whether other people would want to perhaps carry on to their very last breath, that's fine for them. But actually, life being sacred means also respecting people's ability to say, I've, I've had enough of it, um, and, be, and being able to let go. And, 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 and those people who say, oh, thou shalt not, I always think is actually rather arrogant uh, that they can then uh, actually take control of somebody else's life against their will. Well, wouldn't they argue, uh, Jonathan, that they're only fulfilling the, or, or the interpreting the scripture the way, uh, uh, on a literal sense, that listen, you cannot take life, God, uh, you can't play God, you know, G life, you, you find yourself here, and you know, one day you have to go, but God determines that. And so, uh, why are you giving people in that uh, uh, ability to terminate it when, at, th at their sort of request? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you're talking about life being sacred, you're right, you have to have to define what that is. I had a letter in the post, a big long written letter that I very rarely get from somebody in Australia that I only opened yesterday. Um, and he told me the case of someone in his family who had been living actually technically alive for over three years in a care home. And they couldn't speak and they had to have assistance to breathe and they had to have assistance to have some sort of nutrition that was being pumped into them. And he said, what is there that is sacred about that half-life mm. that they didn't want to live, that they pleaded, never let me get into that state? Mm. So when you say sacred, I think you've got to talk about real life, not this sort of shadow land that some mm. people get trapped in for years and years. It's really simply because people around them are afraid and unable to act. Um, so sacred, I think, means real living life, not some sort of shadow land that you can get caught into. Mm. Is sacred the sort of uh, business of beyond cost? It's not something that we 
<clears throat> we consider that uh, you should put a price on life, but it isn't limited to to um, what should I say to to to, to to making value judgments about, but it, but but ultimately, of course, we people make value judgments about their own lives, don't they, and whether it's yes. worth it. I mean, there's no doubt that we should protect life mm. uh, for as long as possible, yeah. and as much as possible, mm. um, but not if it's against the will of the person whose life it actually is. Tash, you you mentioned before about um, who, who about God's. Uh, b uh, your life belonging to God. So, do you believe that your life belongs to God, and that, that it, uh, uh, does that mean that it's only for God to bring it to a close? Can we humans play God anyway? You know, every day doctors uh, take action that saves people's lives. So we're forever interfering with, with the natural course of things. Well, there's just just two things about um, God's power. I mean, all of us are well, powerless to prevent our entry into this world. And we are powerless to prevent our exit from this world. Okay, we just found ourselves here. And it will go one day. Now, for example, when it comes to a uh, terminal ill patient with excruciating pain, do you uh, prolong that life purely on the basis of, uh, of uh, uh, that life is sacred? And by the way, the Quran doesn't say that life is sacred. The Quran says that we shouldn't, this is God's gift to us, but we are autonomous agencies. We, the whole issue of autonomy is crucial because if we don't have autonomy, then how can there be a judgment? Uh, Islam believes that this will come a time of judgment. If I have no autonomy to decide what to do tonight, to go to a lap dancing club or go to have a, a discussion on uh, interfaith relations, uh, I then become, uh, I've ch chosen the good over the bad, so, so to speak. And so we need independence and we need autonomy. And this idea that, you know, all life is sacred, and as Rosie pointed out, you know, if you live in a vegetable state, how is that sacred? You can't do anything in the normal bodily functions, you, you have to be pumped with, with nutrition, you can't go to the toilet, so to speak, all of these things. It's, it's a visible kind of existence, and that is not sacred. I mean, so this idea that all life is sacred, uh, I don't buy that. I do think that life is special and is a gift from God, and that we have no right to impose our belief system on someone else. But if that person chooses to listen for whatever reason that he or she has not decided to listen, they've come to the end of their line, they, they have no more uh, uh, functionality and that they're in excruciating pain, why can't they choose to terminate it? And so I don't buy this argument that life is sacred uh, indiscriminately. Okay. Yeah, I mean, people say, uh, oh, you're playing God as an accusation. Actually, it's a compliment. <laughs> we're supposed to be imitatio Dei, we're supposed to be imitating yeah, God, yeah. And, and, and of course, as you intimated in your question, you know, we're constantly playing God and giving people a heart transplant or a blood transfusion. Mm. We don't say, oh, God wants you to collapse on the road, we're just going to leave you there and let you die. We always intervene uh, mm. to the best, uh, for the best of that person, and sometimes uh, it'll mean giving them extra years, and other times, such as assisted dying, it means allowing them to die with dignity, with peace, without pain. I mean, have we got to the stage now where medical science is so good that it can keep people alive more or less forever if it, if it so wished? Well, we're living longer, but we're not necessarily living mm, better. better. Yeah. Yeah. But this is this is now transgressing into, or not transgressing, good idea, uh, into some really, really fundamental theological concepts because you're asking what kind of a God do you believe in? Mm. If you believe that this life is a gift from God, what sort of a God is that? Mm. Is it really a gift or is it a gift that's conditional? So I'm giving you your life, but hang mm. on a minute, I'm going to still be controlling all the puppets, mm. the, the strings. Um, is it a God that's a sort of command and control God? Or is it a God that says this is a gift and then the choices that you freely make to love me, yes. I know are trustworthy? There's a, there's a philosophical story, isn't mm -hmm. there, about the prince, the prince and the, the um, farm worker girl. And he falls in love with her, but he doesn't summon her to the castle and say, I'm the prince, would you like to be my wife? Mm -hmm. He puts on the rags and goes to the princess mm -hmm. and he only trusts that love and it's freely and equally mm -hmm. given. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the Christian faith certainly is based on that sort of understanding of God, that he wants our love for him to be freely given. And then once you've given that love freely, you can choose to obey 
his ways because you can trust that that's how you're going to flourish. But I don't think it's a com command and control thing. I think that concept of free will mm. is fundamental to the way in which you then set about living your life. And that free will should not be whisked away from you just at the moment when most people feel they need it most. Yes, exactly. We demand free will in everything we do virtually, whether it's a choice of a partner or employment. Yeah. Uh, and, and why cannot we have that yeah. in the choice of death when there's a choice, particularly between a very painful, um, uh, horrible death and, and a death that's peaceful dignified. and dignified in one's own time and place? And finally, I'm going to ask you each of you where you stand in this particular debate. So I'll start with Rosie. Well, what? it's very interesting for me because um, I'm half English and half Swiss. And in Switzerland, they've had assisted dying mm. for over 60 years. And so there's a cultural dynamic to this. The conversations are much more normalized in Switzerland. Everyone, as a part of the process of coming to terms with a terminal diagnosis, thinks quite openly and naturally about, do I want to go down that route or not? And I've had family experience of that being a very good and helpful thing. So I know that it, I, I come with a baggage, a positive baggage, I think. Um, once I started to articulate that, I found that the hierarchy in the Church of England found that very difficult. But, and it was to my surprise, people in the local church were just very, very relieved to be able to have an open conversation about it and said, I'd actually always felt that. I've always thought that wouldn't it be wonderful if I had the ability to say, I, I just don't want to have to go through those last three weeks or three months or whatever it is. I'd like to hand my life back to God now and I'd like that to be okay. And it was a freeing thing and it, it, it was a chance to have a more mature relationship actually with my congregation once that was able to be an open conversation. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the position where I believe that this is an honourable thing totally aligned with my understanding of a good, loving, compassionate God who gives us free will. Jonathan? Yes, and I agree that there's a total disconnect between what the religious hierarchy are saying and what religious people feel. And time and time again I've given talks to all sorts of groups um, and expected to be pilloried and actually found I was pushing at an open door. And the critical question I always um, uh, ask people is, look, forget about the theology or the philosophy, if it was you, and you were dying, and you were in pain, would you like that option? And of course, virtually always the answer is yes. So if you want it for yourself, why can't you give it to other people? And also, I'm very strengthened by the research that's come out of Oregon, and it's allowed us to almost see the future, something I wouldn't normally say. Um, but, you know, Oregon's been doing this for 25 years, and we can see the results. And that actually, it hasn't been sort of um, free-for-all or slippery slope or any of those sort of things. But, but it's been done in a very calm and a very measured way, so much so that the palliative care um, uh, people who in this country are passionately against assisted dying, over there, who were against it, have now come round to it and work in, in harmony. So ultimately, I'm now in favour of legalising assisted dying as an option for those who so wish, although hedge with certain conditions, and the person does have to be mentally competent, uh, terminally ill, and want it of their own free will. Yeah. So, so to, just to be clear, Tim Lee, I, I understand that, that, but in Oregon, uh, the, the the there's this time limit of six months. Would you would you yes. subscribe to that? Yes, I, uh, I think so. Uh, because obviously, we don't want to have a situation where someone who is, uh, for instance, uh, going through a bad patch um, uh, in their forties or whatever, twenties, thirties, whatever, um, and uh, makes a, a, a rash or a hasty decision. Um, uh, and whereas otherwise they, they might have gone on to, after recovering, lead a very sort of long and healthy and happy life. So this is for people whose life is ending anyway, but they want to end it well. And I think actually we have a right, as much as possible, to a good death. Thanks. Tash? Yeah, like, uh, unlike Rosie, uh, I, uh, in my tradition uh, we have uh, Orthodox Islam and, say, traditional Muslims, and for them, they have come with a huge baggage that under no circumstances can interfere with uh, God's uh, uh, prerogatives of giving and taking of life. And like Jonathan, I used to be, um, and I'm quite uh, happy to admit this, I was never fully against assisted dying, but I, I wasn't a big supporter either. And over time now, with studying research, I've realized, listen, you know, um, 
if someone has, has come to that time of their life where there's no f f uh, 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 medically uh, uh, possible reason for them to have a good quality of life and they have excruciating pain and terminally ill, shouldn't they at least have the choice? Mm. And, and the idea is about choice. And so I'm now, uh, there's an open door as far as Muslims are concerned. It's like the door is quite shut mm. and you need sort of a, almost a battering ram to go through this thing because uh, we have to give people choices. And the trouble with Orthodox Islam and traditional Muslims, they don't want to give anyone choices. It's either their way or no way. And so uh, liberal Muslims like myself, progressive Muslims, we are now trying to show that there is an alternative, especially when we live in a highly medicalized society with technology everywhere, uh, able to sort of uh, uh, give prognosis with great precision. We should have an option to decide whether do we wish to have a good death or a bad death. And I think that is something that we should all campaign for, Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, vegetarians, Jedis, the whole lot, <laughs> you know, so that we all come up and yeah. do something positive for all of our society, for the whole community, rather than just for one specific faith. Okay, thank you. Well, from my perspective, uh, it was all brought home to me uh, uh, at the end of last year when my cousin, who was, who from the age of one had suffered from muscular dystrophy, uh, but she'd had a really exciting life within the limits of her mm. uh, her disability. She'd uh, she'd always driven. She'd done parachutes. She'd gone sailing. Uh, but at the end of the day, and she was just over seventy, her um, her arm started to give up, and the, the whole you know she really got to the bad stage of muscular dystrophy. So she took herself off to Switzerland, and um, she said, "I I can't can't live with this anymore." And I fully support what she did because I think she understood that, you know, there's a point in life where you say enough is enough. So thank you all for your thoughts on what I know is a diff difficult subject for people of faith. And I hope for those of uh, you listening to this discussion, it will prove helpful in your understanding and it may form the basis of a uh, discussion you may have on the subject with others. So thank you everybody. <laughs>